Hello everybody and welcome to our edition of uh, Unlocked today, which is a, a very special edition because um, well, we're launching a new film of the Hacker Hunter series today. Our uh, um, cybercrime, real cybercrime uh, series that uh, I hope you are all familiar with. And to launch this, I would usually have uh, my very endeared uh, co-moderator Marco Preuss, but uh, for some reason that we don't understand, he, I couldn't hear him today. So you will have to deal with only me and Jessica Benhamu today, who is um, the director of uh, this episode of Hacker Hunter. And this episode of Hacker Hunter is called, as you can see uh, down here, um, Emotet versus the World Police. And so let me introduce you to our extremely talented um, director, Jessica Benhamu. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Good to have you, Jess. Um, I was thinking I could describe, uh, I could explain to people very wordily who you are, but I thought maybe I'd rather leave that to you. Can you, like in, in five adjectives, Explain who you are. Um, okay, I guess from the journalistic side, I'm curious, um, curious about the world, I'm resourceful in terms of uh, getting uh, getting people, getting things together for a story, I'm hopefully creative, um, uh, adventurous, and I tend to cling hard to my Berber heritage, um, the sort of nomadic roots, basically. Which of these five helps you most in making films? Um, I think curious, because I think when you're making a film, you're working with a lot of different people, and you are also trying to tell a story that's going to matter to a lot of people, and you have to be genuinely interested in other people and other things and other ideas outside of your own worldview. Um, and I think that propels you as a filmmaker and a journalist to kind of go out there and and kind of explore ideas and, and, and situations. Does nomadic help, help too? Because usually I think yeah. right, as a filmmaker, you're traveling a lot. Yes, I would say I would say the um, the willingness to get on a plane, I guess in the pandemic especially, but in general, the willingness to kind of go to a new place and explore it and to be outside of your comfort zone um, and to to get along with or, or to meet all different kinds of people. I kind of feel the nomadic side makes me feel like that I'm interested in more global stories than necessarily small localized stories. And I think you know something like cybercrime is definitely, it's a global story, and we can see that here with all these different people talking to us from around the world. But you didn't actually really travel for this one, right? A little bit. I managed to get to Kiev and Bucharest, um, so there was there was some travel. Germany, it sadly changed its rules right before the shoot, so I'll have to wait till another time. Which uh, gave me the opportunity to be at a shoot at least, so that was uh, also yeah. also good for me. So. The film is about Emotet. Now, um, I assume many people that are listening to us now would know what Emotet is um, because we have a quite technical audience. But um, had you heard about Emotet before you started producing this film? So, a little bit, because when I knew that Max and Stephen would be working on this project, I then started having a read of potential cybercrime stories. So when I knew that you guys were, were looking for stories, I then started doing my own sort of scouting on the internet. And this was one of the stories that came up um, that I thought could be really interesting. So when it turned out that you were looking into it as well, I thought that was that was great. Um, so yeah, and I, I think it's just becoming more and more on everybody's radar, cybercrime, especially in the last year or two. Um, every person that we spoke to said that the number of cases have skyrocketed during the pandemic. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's impossible now not to be aware of cybercrime. Yeah, I think it's becoming a bigger topic. Um, even big late night shows are talking about ransomware now, for example, as I just uh, had just seen. Um, but was it difficult for you to get into that topic when it started? Um, 
So I think the reason that all filmmakers would be a bit cautious when it comes to cybercrime is is about what you can show on the screen. So I think the challenges are about the fact that it's a computer-centered story um, and it's about trying to show the dangers of that in a way that people can see and hear um, rather than read. So I think I think that's that's where it becomes more more of a challenge um, in terms of finding a way to to tell the story. Um, yeah. Um, if you look at it now that you made this film and you made a film about Emotet, and we will talk a bit more about what it was about, but uh, what was your most important learning from making this film? So. Hmm. I think the, the thing I feel after every project is that the people that you work with are the most important because if you get your team right, then your whole process is becomes so much easier. Um, I think with something like this, especially because we had all of these different shoots around the world, communicating really clearly with multiple different camera people um, across the world was a challenge because it has to feel like the story is very uniform. And if someone has their own style or something, it, it all has to feel like it's part of the same whole. So I think having really clear communication, um, picking the right people, people whose style fits what you want to do, um, all of those things are really important, I think, um, on the project. But if you think in cyber terms, did you learn anything? In, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, well, <laughs> in cyber terms, I really need to rethink some of my passwords. Um, I think that it came up again and again, um, this idea that only idiots with the same password for multiple different kinds of websites. And I sort of went very quiet and didn't say very much <laughs> in response to that. Um, I think also I wasn't quite aware. I, have, um, I think that was a little bit horrifying that there, there have been conversations I've had with Uh, various family members um, from working on this story um, and then anytime anything goes wrong from a technical perspective paranoia that, <laughs> that I may be being hacked or something uh, so I think I've learned about how to be more secure and safer on the internet um, and also I think um, I think just how complicated it is in terms of law enforcement actually i think that was very interesting to find out about just as a moment marco can you try to say a word no marco's audio is still not working i can see him here in the green room but he's uh, unfortunately still so we'll have to do without marco today um he had the most beautiful background i've ever seen um so We, you've spoke, spoken to a few victims of Imhotep, um, and usually we know it's difficult to find uh, victims. Maybe not even so difficult to find them, but to make them speak in front of the camera. Did you find it hard to, uh, to get to speak to them? Well, we had you, of course, to help. So mm -hmm. we had quite a few German victims in this story, um, and I think um, having a German member of the team, German speaker, was uh, quite essential to um, getting the cooperation of the hospital and, and the publishing house. Um, we've also got uh, Lara Ingram, who's, doing, who's a story producer, and she's built um, her reputation over many years um, in the cybersecurity space and has all of this network of contacts. So I think that reputation enabled her to kind of um, when people's trust as well in general and um, people knew that they were part of something that would be um, done well and, and I think that really that really helped and um, it was quite challenging in terms of interviewing um, we had a few kind of with language problems I think that makes it a bit more of a challenge um, but I like to think that we got past them despite my um, complete lack of German One of the most fascinating things about this film for me was uh, before we even started producing, we got uh, this, I don't know, 20 minutes of uh, footage from the raid that the Ukrainian police did. Um, you then flew to the Ukraine and uh, spoke to, to police there. Um, 
How much pride was there with the Ukrainian police? Oh, lots of pride. Um, they, they were the only police force to give us goodie bags. Uh, so, in fact, in fact, hold on. Um, I still have my little flag. So, um, <laughs> it's here on my desk. Um, I have some stickers and uh, other little bits from the Ukrainian cyber police. So, yeah, I think they were very proud. They were very proud of... Um, of what they'd done, this this felt quite novel. This felt like a step up um, compared to other cases, even though they've they've already done many many cases. Um, it was a fairly new department from the last I don't know, last maybe five years old or something like that. Like it wasn't that old, um, so there was definitely an excitement around around this particular case. My impression in that whole production was that, well, I was surprised how many. Many police and uh, other law enforcement we managed to speak to. Um, what was your impression? Which kind of message did they want to to deliver? Hmm. So I was a bit worried about this because I thought we might get a very sort of PRE kind of position, which can be quite difficult to um, to get a sense of different personalities and stuff. I felt people were quite forthcoming, to be honest. Um, I felt that, um, I think the thing that they all had in common is that they all had glowing things to say about each other. So it seems like genuinely the collaboration had worked very well and that they, they were nothing but really, um, uh, That they that they felt that they they had been kind of fortified by each other, and everyone had brought their separate skills, and everyone had brought brought things to the mix. Um, so that was quite interesting because when you're dealing with so many different bureaucratic um, organizations, you might expect it actually to feel a bit a bit more bumpy. Um, but at least that was you know that's the line they gave us that everything everything was great. Um, <laughs> uh, cooperating with all these different. Uh, law enforcement agencies there's this quote in the film of uh, from i think it's from from tara wheeler who we interviewed um who says the key to success for the police was that they started thinking like hackers and she says yes. you needed organized police organized international police to stop organized global cybercrime um can you explain what she meant with that well i, I think it, it's they had to find ways to to work together they had to be very proactive and cooperative and they had to use by hook or by crook. they basically what she means is it is this kind of resourcefulness because if you weren't able to hack into systems in one country you would have to kind of go through um, the law in a different country and pull out what would be advantageous to you. So this kind of ruthless um, resourcefulness um, where you will do whatever you can to get the result that you want, essentially that is, I think, what she means by, by thinking like hackers. Um, because the, the ends in this case are moral and just, but there is obviously the danger um, that the any means necessary can 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 become a little bit murkier so it, it was a good um an important um uh kind of cooperation was important taking the tech down but you know for instance this suspect is still just the suspect that has been um that was found in the ukraine so i guess you know you you would want you would hope basically that he truly is guilty um, and there's no chance that they that they they've got the wrong guy basically because if you do get the wrong guy or wrong woman and you use those kind of means maybe it becomes a little bit more um, a bit more difficult to draw the line morally. Let's try that again, Marco. Are you there? No, nah, you're not. Um... But when you say let's hope they have the right guy, I mean you've seen that footage, right? How, yeah. they, uh, how, how they broke into that flat and they found gold and money and an open computer that was um, 
not encrypted uh, and uh, they had all the data they needed. Do you have any doubts that this guy was the actual culprit or one of the actual culprits? Um, before I answer, it's saying that we're offline, by the way, so I don't know if we're live. Are we live still? Yeah, we are. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I think we are based on, on the evidence they have. However, um, the fact that they were still finding evidence, they're still searching for evidence, does mean that um, that, that they didn't have everything that they needed to put him in jail before um, invading invading his home so i guess i mean i i like to, I, i'm not part of the police force so i cannot possibly comment on whether this person is guilty i'd like to believe he is based on everything that they must have but um but we don't know that yet because due process hasn't happened um we don't know do you know when the when the case is going to court um i don't think they gave us a specific date for that yet okay um so we've spoken about the police, um, but an interesting part about the film is also that they were actually able to take someone down. We don't see that so often. Um, yes, we're back. I think we had a bit of a glitch. Um, there might have been a short glitch. If that, so, so my question was, um, we don't see it so often that someone has been taken down. Um, which kind of information did they did you get from the police? How they actually caught them? So this was when you know we, we tried to probe as far as possible, but because it's an ongoing investigation, there was definitely a limit to what they would share. Um, I think the thing that seems to be a really a running theme is that people can be very careful about. Um, about their professional life, and then they're not very careful about their their personal life. And there's been lots of cases in documentaries actually where there's um, uh, where a criminal is found not because of their in the incredible system that they set up, but because of some thoughtless um, email or something that they posted on the internet. Um, there's a famous example of this. I wasn't it the um, Oh, the Silk Road, wasn't it? It was an email, it was a post before it was it was made, the marketplace was made that gave away the connection between the person creating it um, and and the thing itself. And I, I think people forget that social media um, can really undermine you and the things that you write on the internet out of vanity or just sharing with your, your circles um, can end up basically... Um, shooting yourself in the foot if you're a criminal so yeah so it, see, it seemed to be the interplay between the two rather than purely technical um technical uh weaknesses i would say yeah i think um the the german investigator said right they were very secretive about their network but uh, they were less secretive on social media which um, yes Sounds like a very stupid thing to do, right? You have this this network of, let's say, the most successful cyber criminal network for many, many years. And then they give their identity away on social media and uh, they walk into this flat and none of the data is uh, encrypted. And when that guy connected to the command and control service, he didn't even use VPN. So he connected from his home IP address, which sounds like stupidly naive, doesn't it? I can't, I haven't quite caught the last sentence you said. You ah, sort I of said, went a little bit. I said, that sounds stupidly naive, doesn't it? Um, why, why do you think, uh, do, do you think people are maybe getting too... Um, too self-assured at some point when they've been successful for so too long? I think that if you are committing those kind of crimes, um, there's probably a part of you that has a slightly 
narcissistic detachment to, to other people in terms of a lack of empathy to 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 to, pick, to attack a hospital for sure um and and that kind of narcissistic approach means you can't quite help yourself um they say don't they that if you if you murder somebody you're you're very likely to go to the uh, memorial or something or if you've committed a crime you can't you can't stay away from the police force and actually you try to they're most likely to be um to come close to the the law enforcement because they can't quite resist um being close and, and knowing what's going on or knowing what's been said about them so i think i think you know social media and narcissism i, I think that goes hand in hand and i reckon the impulse to show what you've achieved in some capacity whether it's by what you've spent um on on flashy cars or whatever i think i think that impulse is probably hard to shut down um so yeah so i i reckon i reckon narcissism is probably the problem <laughs> Um, and, and yeah, I think people are arrogant because you, you think that you are better and able to get away with it. And we all know, at least in, uh, in media, there's plenty of people like that. So I'm not surprised at all that they would be showing off on the internet. My favorite scene in that film is when, these, when there are two Ukrainian cyber policemen sitting next to each other. Um, they're basically not moving. One of them is talking, the other one is just looking into the camera and uh, he says, and it feels like he still doesn't believe that when he says, well, and we looked at this computer and the data was, and then he's, he's getting slow and says, and the data was not encrypted, open for analysis. And I, I, I found that had an incredible level of, uh, of humor to it, also it wasn't intended. Um, what's your favorite scene of that film? I, so I love that moment because in the interview, in the sort of mock interview we did beforehand, it was a sort of young puppy officer who, who did all the talking. Um, and the one who talks principally in the, in the interview itself um, is the other guy who was completely quiet pretty much didn't say anything um, in the sort of mock interview. And I, I've seen that before where the person is really quiet as soon as the camera is turned on, suddenly becomes really, really talkative. Um, and sometimes even when they swear they're not gonna say anything and just let the other person talk. Um, so that that was quite funny um, just from that perspective as well. And I, I liked just how serious they were as well. Um, they're kind of how you imagine um, those kind of officers to be. I think. What I like with Linda, the German prosecutor, is how far against type she went, because I think you're expecting them all to be very serious um, about what they do. And actually, I've just never seen, she, she kind of made me feel like she was like a very excitable scout girl. You know, the kind of person who wants to sit front row of every class, who's always got their hand up and is kind of like, pick me, pick me, pick me. Uh, so I quite liked her kind of huge enthusiasm um for the work that she does i feel that was that was really refreshing yeah i also remember when she when she called us back at the beginning um i had her on the phone and she definitely was like i had a five minutes conversation with her but i thought she must be amazing in front of the camera she even uh, had to, an outstanding level of energy just just on the phone and yeah she did definitely deliver on that um, of all the characters in that film, I know it's it's not fair to ask that question, but who was your favorite character in that film? I'm going to have to go with Tara Wheeler, um, just because she is the stuff novels are made out of. You know, like she is just uh, there's just something a little bit dangerous, a little bit kind of. It doesn't matter what she's talking about. You're kind of hanging on every word. She's just absolutely fascinating. Um, I think she's the, the person I would most have, want to have over for dinner. Um, and, and when we did the interview hours beforehand, her father, she, she's also a professional poker player as is her father. Her father had just won something like $100,000 in poker. And then she had to finish the interview by a certain time to go and fly a plane. And honestly, I've just never had a contributor 
um, live such a glamorous <laughs> life. Um, so yeah, I think she was um, just an absolutely fascinating uh, person. Um, and I feel also that, you know, it's obviously still a male dominated space cybersecurity, but you just wouldn't get the sense that Tara would have struggled ever in that kind of atmosphere. You get the sense that she'd have just had this kind of regal presence, you know, um, and it's that it was never, it's never something, it's never been a hurdle, you know, she's just kind of owned um, who she is and, and has that kind of confidence um, that I think um, is quite inspiring, actually. Yeah, I, uh, her husband tweeted a few days ago when he saw Tisa and he said he's impressed how you made his wife look even more scary than she looks in real life. So um, obviously she's an, uh, an impressive uh, character and I think she said a few really, really interesting things there. Um, and that's it, uh, by the way. So we are we are reaching the end of time uh, for our time today because the film will actually launch in uh, two minutes, from what I can see. Um, thank you, Jess. Uh, thanks for directing this wonderful film for us. I think it's a beautiful uh, fifteen minutes uh, film about an important topic. Thank you, Marco, for trying to reconnect and reconnect and reconnect and still uh, freaking out in this little window up there. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us here today we will um, now leave that film to you um, enjoy it uh, please let us know what you think about it in the comments afterwards and um, yeah that's it for today thank you <laughs>